Next time, turn to the, to the meat of the day, and that's our keynote speaker, Ralph Remington, the Director of Cultural Affairs here in the city. Ralph was appointed Director of Cultural Affairs uh, for the San Francisco Art Commission in January 2021 by Mayor London Breed. He has extensive professional experiences in arts administration and government and is a director, actor, essayist, playwright, and screenwriter. Prior to joining the Art Commission, uh, Ralph served as Deputy Director of Arts and Culture for the City of Tempe, Arizona, and was responsible for Tempe Center of the Arts comprehensive performance and visual art programming, overseeing public art, the Tempe Histo History Museum, arts engagement, and municipal arts. Of course, his bio goes on and on and with ma major accomplishments. One thing I will point out in keeping with uh, Mayor Breed's comments and about the HBCU activity going on here, that uh, Ralph, was, while he was born in Philadelphia and holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree from Howard University. It's you. Now, we had a little chat just before this came up. See, I'm an alumnus of Florida A&M University, and we happened to beat Howard last year in the national championship. But I still, still love him. Let's give Ralph a round of applause and come up for a talk. We started from the bottom, now we're here. We started from the bottom, now the whole world up in here. It's like a jungle sometimes. It makes you wonder how I keep from going under. Two years ago, a friend of mine asked me to say some MC rhyme, so I said this rhyme I'm about to say. The rhyme was deaf, but then it went this way. Greetings, everyone. Those were the lyrics of Drake, Melly Mel, of Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, and Run DMC, three black hip hop legends. Today, I want to provide some reflections on the immense contributions African Americans have made to the arts in this country, often in the face of tremendous adversity. The influence of black artists, musicians, writers, and performers on American culture is undeniable. Our stories, songs, and innovations have shaped the very fabric of this nation. From the days of slavery, when our ancestors crafted poetry and music that gave voice to their suffering, to the explosion of African-American art during the Harlem Renaissance that celebrated our humanity, to the birth of jazz, blues, rock and roll, and hip hop that changed music forever. And now the paintings of our black visual artists like Kehinde Wally, Jordan Castile, and Jean-Michel Basquiat fetch some of the highest prices in the world. And yet, the gift of black art has not come without a cost. Our artists have continually confronted the forces of racism and oppression that seek to limit the creations and deny our full expression. Figures like Paul Robeson, Nina Simone, Josephine Baker, Sidney Poitier, and countless others found so much of their work banned or boycotted simply for touching on the truth of the black experience. Even legendary writers like James Baldwin, Amiri Baraka, and Richard Wright, who exposed the ugly reality of racism in America through their writing, often found themselves marginalized or forced into exile abroad because their commentary was so threatening. Their insights into the black condition and what James Baldwin called the fire next time resonate as deeply today as ever. The same is true of our other pioneers like Langston Hughes and W.B. Du Bois, Maya Angelou, Tupac Shakur, August Wilson, and so many others who use the arts to advance justice and change hearts and minds. Their perspectives became a threat precisely because of their profound impact. So when we celebrate the incredible contributions African Americans have made to music, film, dance, poetry, theater, and visual arts, 
we must do so with the full knowledge that this required perseverance and courage in the face of injustice. And we ca as we carry this artistic legacy forward, we must continue to foster truth-telling, celebrate our history, and cultivate a new generation of black artists. Our stories and culture remain just as critical to moving America forward today. We currently live in dark and troubled times. We live in a country that seemingly wants to continue denying our existence and act as if black Americans are a culture of takers when nothing could be further from the truth. We have consistently given to this country, whether in times of war where we served courageously or fighting for the civil rights of all people through the civil rights movement, women's liberation movement, labor movement, the LGBTQ movement, or during our recent COVID pandemic where black healthcare workers, essential workers, and emergency responders literally laid their lives on the line every day to save others. Our major cities in the United States are literally powered by black and brown civil servants who quietly go about the work of trying to make people's lives better. And where would we have been during the pandemic without our artists bringing joy to our homes through Netflix, YouTube, and various other streamers? That's art. That's what we did. And what are the thanks that we get to that? What do we get for it? We are told by some that slavery was a good thing, and we should be grateful. We are told that our history is not important enough to be taught to white children because they may get their feelings hurt. The term indoctrination is used loosely and inappropriately to justify the marriage of white America to ignorance. James Baldwin once said, I think the artist is a disturber of the peace. I think the artist is a disturber of the peace because he is produced by the people because the people need him. The people may not like him, they may stone him, but they need him. His sole responsibility is to bear witness to and for the people who produced him. This is the responsibility of the artist, to bear witness in the face of overwhelming odds. But there are costs attached to such commitment. It's no secret that many of our black artists have died in the pursuit of the truth or because knowing the truth became too impossible to bear. Many black artists have turned to drugs and alcohol for a momentary respite from the pain, a break from all of the madness. When one lives in a world that persistently degrades and destructs oneself for being their whole entire selves, who could blame them? As the Bay Area band Green Day once put it, there's nothing wrong with me. This is how I'm supposed to be in a land of make-believe that don't believe in me. I am heartbroken because some of our greatest artists like Prince and Michael Jackson are no longer with us. Prince had a large footprint, larger than Michael Jackson's in my opinion. Michael was to Prince what Elvis was to the Beatles. Michael and Elvis were consummate entertainers and artists in their own right. However, Prince and the Beatles were artists on another level. They showed us parts of ourselves that we didn't know existed. Prince played with androgyny and racial identity in a way that no black artist had done before. Unlike Michael Jackson, he never denied his blackness, but instead embraced it and showed us another angle. He did it with his music and his unapologetic romantic choices. He took it out and swung it around for all to see, playing it like a virtuoso. Prior to Prince, only white rock stars had played so boldly with identity. David Bowie particularly comes to mind, Elton John to a lesser extent, glam rockers and the list goes on. Even the Stones played with it, but brothers didn't really go there. Not in that way. Little Richard and Sylvester perhaps, but still. Prince was a mashup of James Brown, Jimi Hendrix, Carlos Santana, Clapton, Little Richard, David Bowie, Sly Stone, Jackie Wilson, Mozart, and many more rolled into one. Prince was perhaps the first postmodern black rock star. He came from a generation 
that was finally free to see blackness differently than the way we were raised to perceive it in the various urban jungles and rural enclaves across the country. In a way, this is nothing new. Jimi Hendrix did it so long ago to become arguably the, the greatest guitarist ever. Prince's talents for racial deconstruction are legendary. The film Purple Rain was a literal celebratory orgy of black deconstruction. And perhaps one could say that life in the Midwest or various other black cultural out outposts helped to engender deconstruction affinity. As a black artist in Minneapolis and now here in San Francisco, I've often felt as if I lived a life in exile. Having been born and raised in the black streets of West Philly, I was in the thick of it. Anything could pop off at any time. He was shot. He was arrested. She got raped. He robbed the liquor store. That white boy called me a lit. You were always ready and armed to go, ready for battle. That's just the way black life was in the cold wilderness of North America on the East Coast. Then when I was stationed abroad in Europe as a soldier in the U.S. Army, I learned that life didn't have to be mired in race and friction. Race didn't have to dominate one's existence. In America, I was black first and American second. In Europe, I was American first and black was the cherry on top. Europe showed me life outside of the forest for I was so deeply entrenched in the poisonous racial cauldron of America that I couldn't see the trees. I was never the same again. After returning from Europe, I realized why I always felt out of place. The streets of Philly conspired to give little black boys and girls a constricted view of the world. There was no possibility of intellectual interrogation or deconstruction. There was only survival, racial and literal. I suspect Jimi Hendrix realized this, as did Jay-Z and Tina Turner, Romar Bearden, Eartha Kitt, Miles Davis, Chuck Berry, and a host of others. The potential altitude gained by blacks in this country is commensurate with our collective ability to break through boundaries of racial demarcation and identification. That is freedom. Breaking out of boxes that have been prescribed for us and crafting our own identities. White America responds to a deconstructed black image because it doesn't present itself as an angry narrative. One can be pro-black while not being anti-white and at the same time not hate one's own black self. I think in the end, I realized, like the author Isabel Wilkins wrote, that what we are experiencing in this country is too complex to be summarized simply as racism. We have been contained in a caste system. According to Wikipedia, a caste is a fixed social group into which an individual is born within a particular system of social stratification, a caste system. Within such a system, individuals are expected to marry exclusively within the same caste, a practice known as endogamy, follow lifestyles often linked to a particular occupation, hold a ritual status observed within a hierarchy, and interact with others based on cultural notions of exclusion. The same system that oppressed the Dalits in India and the Jews in Nazi Germany, as well as the blacks in South Africa during apartheid. In fact, the Nazis learned their practices and philosophies from the US and our country's Jim Crow system of caste and racial subordination. Think about that for a minute. The Nazis learned their stuff from us. If you haven't seen it, I would highly encourage you to watch the film Origin by Ava DuVernay where she illustrates the points made by Isabel Wilkerson in her aptly titled New York Times bestseller, Cast. You will be stunned. Arts and culture are subversive. The arts subvert cast because it holds a mirror up to the commonality of our humanity, enabling us to experience intense sensations of joy, sorrow, pain, and reflection. Black America has turned our containerized existence within caste into a culture that is emulated and idolized throughout the world. 
During times of segregation, the sounds of Motown blared out of white household windows. The same white people who were upholding segregation were listening to Diana Ross and the Supremes, or the Temptations, or the Four Tops, or the Spinners, or Nat King Cole, or watching Bill Cosby on TV when he starred in I Spy in the 60s. Over time, it is very difficult for racists to hold on to an idea that dehumanizes black people when black folks bring them so much joy in other areas, be they arts or sports. At some point, the reflective individual knows that there are no real differences between human beings. Most of white America lives in segregation. White people have the privilege of being able to live their whole entire lives without coming into contact with people of color on a regular basis. Most black folks must have some sort of facility with white people in order to traverse socioeconomic boundaries. Art is the connective tissue that binds us all together. Art has helped black America to make it make sense. I remember a day when we hardly saw images of ourselves in popular media. When I grew up, there were only three channels on TV, CBS, NBC, and ABC. I'm sure some of y'all remember that. When a black person appeared on television, you know what would happen. Everybody would call all the neighbors, black person on TV. And we all turned on our respective sets and we watched a background dancer or a comedian or an actor uh, from a new film getting interviewed. But for the most part, we grew up in segregation. When I was a kid, only two black people had ever won an Oscar. Hattie McDaniel for playing a maid, Mammy, Gone with the Wind in 1939, and Sidney Poitier for playing a handyman, Homer, Homer Smith in Lilies of the Field in 1963. Both roles portrayed blacks in service to white people. Since then, black artists like Denzel Washington, Holly Berry, Louis Gossett Jr., Whoopi Goldberg, Forrest Whitaker, Cuba Gooding Jr., Viola Davis, Octavia Spencer, Jamie Foxx, Regina King, Will Smith, Lupita Nyong'o, Daniel Kaluuya, Mahershala Ali, and Ariana DeBose have gone on to win Oscars for acting. That is progress. We've also won o Oscars in many non-acting areas, <clears throat> and many more have won Grammys, Tonys, Emmys, you name it. The first black woman lead that I can remember on a TV series was Diane Carroll, playing a nurse on Julia. That was appointment television. Some of y'all may be too young to remember that. But then, of course, there was All in the Family, The Jeffersons, Good Times, Sanford and Son, on screen, there was Richard Pryor, Louis Gossett Jr., James Earl Jones, you know, Bill Cosby, Sidney Poitier. But I would be remiss in the spirit of Chinese New Year and the Year of the Dragon if I didn't mention the idol of every black boy in my neighborhood, Bruce Lee. While Bruce won black, yeah, Bruce Lee. San Francisco's own. While Bruce wasn't black, he was Chinese. You couldn't tell us that. We all had Bruce Lee posters on our walls. We saw every Bruce Lee film that came out. Chinese Connection, Fist of Fury, Return of the Dragon, The Big Boss, Enter the Dragon. We were there, front row center, watching Bruce Lee do his thing. We didn't recognize the difference between Bruce Lee and who we were. We knew deep down that Bruce was othered in a similar way that we were othered. We saw ourselves in Bruce Lee, in his struggles to break into a field that made it very clear that just like us, he was not welcome. And in the absence of very few role models of color, Bruce Lee filled a huge void for all of us to, 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 to model. And even without a developed racial analysis, we little black kids knew that he was our people too. Bruce Lee and martial arts films even influenced the birth of the legendary hip-hop gang, the hip-hop group, the Wu-Tang Clan, in 1993. In this year of the dragon, Bruce Lee's Chinese zodiac sign, we would do well to remember that 
history amidst all of the anti-Asian hate that is stoked by white supremacist culture. President Barack Obama and First Lady Michelle Obama knew the importance of art. Never before have we seen such an amazing procession of black artists perform at the White House as we witnessed over the eight years of their tenure. And now it's award season again. And while watching the various award shows, I found myself reflecting on all the years that black people weren't even allowed in these spaces. White people were free to enjoy a, a segregated arts world where they called themselves the best and yet black people weren't even allowed to compete with them. So white folks were essentially graded on a curve. And, we, you know, and when we were finally allowed to compete, we started winning awards previously confined to whiteness. We saw this very same dynamic play out in professional sports. Before blacks integrated white baseball, we were regarded as inferior. But now we couldn't imagine baseball, basketball, the NFL, or even golf or tennis without recognizing black excellence. In fact, I want you for, this, for a second to just try to imagine a world without jazz, rock and roll, the blues, gospel, R&B, country, hip hop, and rap. That's what the world would look like without the contributions of black artists in it, a world without those art forms. And now, politically and culturally, we, we must lean into our rich history to find the strength and fortitude to continue to rise. Culture is what defines us. Culture signals to the world who we are. Culture tells us who we were, who we are, and who we aspire to be. And that's why culture wars are such a powerful political tool. If you allow them to destroy your culture and erase the contributions you have made and rewrite history, they will silence and destroy you. So while we have come far, there is still much more work to do to ensure that our culture and our art is not lost or forgotten. Standing before you is the proud product of Howard University, HBCU, I am proud to serve as your first black director of cultural affairs at the San Francisco Arts Commission in its 92-year existence. Since I started in 2021, we have invested over $18.4 million in support of black artists, arts organizations, and cultural centers. That is unprecedented and makes me proud. It makes me proud to live, work, and assist fellow artists to thrive in such an amazing city like San Francisco that has shown its commitment in helping the arts blossom. I would like to take a moment to thank our wonderful mayor, Mayor London Breed, our arts mayor, for her continued dedication and leadership in support of arts and culture. I literally would not be in my role without her, so let's give it up. In addition, I'd like to thank our dedicated staff that make all of our work possible, as well as the commissioners of the San Francisco Arts Commission, led by President Chuck Collins, who, there he is right there. I'd like to thank all of our arts and cultural workers in San Francisco, from independent artists to nonprofit arts organizations to community-based culture bearers and everyone in between. Thanks for all the vibrancy, joy, and life that you bring to our great city. I'd like to thank Al Williams and the San Francisco African American Historical and Cultural Society for inviting me to speak here today. And so with that, I, I want to leave you with this. In a dark and troubled era, Art and culture is the ultimate form of resistance. Art should disturb the comfortable and comfort the disturbed. We do this not only for ourselves, but for the benefit of society as a whole, just as our ancestors did. For it is impossible to tell the story of America as a whole without acknowledging and honoring the creative genius, passion, and resilience of the African-American artist.
Arts and culture saves lives. It saved mine. Our voice is American culture. I just want to thank you for joining me in honoring this legacy as we continue the work of building a more just and equitable future for the arts and for all people. Please enjoy Black History Month. Thank you.